What's going on, everybody? Hardest part of the ring. Back at ya. For another retro pay-per-view review. Not just any pay-per-view review. Oh, no. Today, as you probably ascertained by the title of this podcast, we are going to revisit WrestleMania 17. Or... WrestleMania X7. Whatever you prefer. WrestleMania 17 is what I call it. We're going to be reviewing it today, and it's going to be a good, good time. I say it's a good time because if you had if you had a gun to my head and you made me pick my favorite wrestling show of all time, it would be this one. As many of you may know, I've been going through the WWE Network they have every Raw, every SmackDown, every pay-per-view that WWE has ever produced. I'm going through it all, man. I'm not not just pay-per-view to pay-per-view. I'm going to Raws, every every Raw, every SmackDown, up to this pay-per-view. And man, I haven't watched th- this WrestleMania in years. But, I mean, I haven't watched the build-up to this show <laughs> since it aired, you know? Um, and I gotta say, it does add a lot. It adds a lot to uh, kind of see the context play out in front of you. Yeah, let's just, I mean, the main event. Rock and Stone Cold. Now, I had totally forgot that they kind of like inserted Debra into the storyline, into the build to that match. It was so, so strange because I, I didn't remember it at all. And then they all of a sudden make Debra, who, by the way, at the time is Stone Cold's real wife, they make Debra the Rock's manager. And now and then the storyline's supposed to be. Oh, is there is there a conflict of interest? Is uh, who who is Debra going to support? But then they, I guess they, at some point. They realized that nobody gave a shit about Deborah and that, hey, you have in front of you the two biggest stars in wrestling history right in front of you. That's all you need. You don't need these other soap opera elements to it. Get The Rock. Get Stone Cold. They are both red hot, as hot as they have ever been. Biggest faces of the company. But which one is the biggest face of the company? Well, that's what we use WrestleMania to decide when they put the WWF title on the line between those two men. Great, great shit. I mean, the show in its entirety was great. It was great from top to bottom, but that build to Rock and Austin is probably the best build I've ever seen to a match. I posted on Instagram a while ago as I was watching that um, that sit-down interview that The Rock and Austin did with uh, Jim Ross mediating it. I had seen clips here and there of that interview over the years but I, I hadn't sat down and watched the entire thing probably since it aired, honestly. And um, it was like a 10 minute long interview and it was as close to a perfect build as you can get. Because, you know, when we think of Rock and Austin, obviously they're like the, you know, they're they're two of the Re- Mount Rushmore wrestlers. They're, they're the mainstream, they're mainstream characters even to this day. They're, um, they defined that entire era which many call the golden era of wrestling. But when we think of them, we think of, you know, we think of Austin cracking beers and spraying Vince McMahon in the ring with with a fucking beer hose. We think of Rocks raising his eyebrow, spitting out his catchphrases, getting the entire crowd in the palm of his hand. We think of fucking the people's elbow. We think of Austin throwing the Rocks belt off the bridge. We think of their entire their history together, that that colorful, flamboyant, that really exciting, flashy history. But when we're here in, in March of 2001, you have The Rock on one side, and you have Stone Cold Steve Austin on the other side, in a room with Jim Ross. Now, there's no, there's no pageantry, there's no beers, there's no $1,000 shirts. It's just two guys who are legitimately, legitimately at the top of the industry. Austin 316 and his whole rivalry with Vince McMahon took the company and took the industry to a completely different level. Arguably the biggest star of all time is Stone Cold Steve Austin. He got hurt and then who took that ball? The Rock. The Rock took that ball and took it to even greater heights, carrying that company for well over a year. So basically you have Austin at the the tippy top, then you have Rock at the tippy top on the other side. And the question is, who is that defining character? Who is that person that kind of carries that company's flag, right? Now this is all in storyline, but it's also all in real life, you know? These two, in, in numerous interviews that 
these guys have had and Stone Cold's podcast and The Rock's Instagram, they both have mentioned that there was a true rivalry between those two. There was a true competitive nature between those two guys and who was that top star. You can have a lot of top stars in a company. You can have oodles of them. But to be that one marquee guy, that one guy where you like, when you see that WWF logo, who's the face that you think about when you see it? And that's what that WrestleMania match is all about. But you have that interview and that brought The Rock out of his like catchphrase mentality, right? He's not just going out there talking about the millions and he's not, you know, smack a candy ass or whatever the fuck. That's not that Rock. That This is Dwayne Johnson we have sitting here. There's no fans singing along with him. And there's no glass shattering when Stone Cold is there. There's no beer cans. You have two guys stripped of all spectacle who just wanted to be the best in the business. That's it. At the end of the day, that's what wrestling is. It's, you know, you got, a, you got a collection of men and women scratching and clawing to get to the top of the mountain. And in 2001, the top of the mountain was that WWF championship. And that's what was on the line in the main event of WrestleMania 17. They didn't need Deborah. That was the kind of storylines they were doing back then. It was soap opera shit. So it was consistent with the time, but they didn't need it. And they thankfully took that element out of the, out of the storyline before the actual match. And you could tell those two guys didn't didn't want Deborah involved. They didn't need Deborah involved because it would just muddy the true, legitimate rivalry that they had. It's an organic narrative that was has been laid out over the course of a year or two. It's organic, and they took it and they ran with it. These two always brought the best out of each other, and I think a lot of that can be attributed to the uh, competition between those two. Once again, that interview with Jr. They're just like both bursting from the seams. They're like. You can see how tense they are, like legitimately tense. That 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 is passion. That's that's an element you saw back then that may be a little bit absent nowadays. Is that true, true passion? It was real. Everything it was all real to them. And they both wanted to be that marquee guy, and that's what they sought to do at WrestleMania 17. But as far as the show as a whole, as crazy as it's, as it seems, Rock and Austin was only a small part of it. Because WrestleMania 17, April 1st, 2001, was about as close as you can get to a perfect show. It was pretty much perfect. It was perfect because it had something for everybody. And all of those different elements, all those different magnitudes, all those different styles were all executed almost to perfection. Some, In some cases, to absolute perfection. Everyone was on that night. Like I said, you have Rock and Austin, top of the company, top of the industry. Two faces of the WWF at the time. True rivalry, true feud. Everyone wanted to see them lock up. But at the same time, you have that spectacle. You have something like Kurt Angle versus Chris Benoit. Which, by the way, had a great build in itself. Basically, you know, two submission specialists trying to assert their submission ability as dominant over the other. Technical wizardry. Or maybe you just want a car crash to which you get... Raven versus Big Show versus Kane in a hardcore match. Or maybe you want to see a blow off to one of the top heel groups in the right to censor. Or maybe you want a different kind of car crash in one of the best matches of all time, TLC2. Maybe you just want to harp on old times and get some a nostalgia hit. Hey, we got the gimmick battle royal for you. Chris Jericho versus William Regal, another technical masterclass. Maybe you love that soap opera shit and everybody at the time loved it. Probably one of the hottest matches of the night. You got Shane McMahon versus Vince McMahon. Adding in that element of WCW folding, which, oh, by the way, just in case you needed another layer to the show, Vince McMahon bought out WCW mere days before this show. Maybe a week or two. Add in the element of Shane buying the company out from under his dad just to add on top of you know the really really quality heel work that vince was doing at that time probably one of the best heels of all time during this period all that together made for an emotional passionate match that was thoroughly entertaining triple h versus undertaker you have two of the other huge stars in the company you have Rock and Austin on one level, and right below that, you have Triple H and Undertaker setting up future feuds. So there's literally something for everybody on this show. You have spectacle, you have 
technical wrestling, you have car crashes, you have women, you have men, you have young, you have old, you have one-on-one, -on -one, you have multi-man matches, you have heel factions, you got Mick Foley, you got Hillbilly Jim, you got, you got everybody. Something for everybody, and the show was so easy to digest. But a little over three hours, perfect length. Every match got the amount of time that it needed. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that, but for the most part, every match felt full and felt satisfying. So with that, we might as well just get right into it, right? So the show opens up to a packed Astrodome. Incredible atmosphere. I think it was like, what, 70, 80,000 people there. Huge huge show signs are everywhere you got the smoke from the pyro you got the the sunlight gleaming in from the top of the stadium it was such a cool atmosphere uh the set was great also another element to the show that made it unique was the commentary you had uh you had jr of course but you also had paul Heyman. now if you remember jerry the king lawler walked out of the company about a month before this show. So JR and Heyman were still a relatively new duo. And I gotta say, these two are probably the most underrated commentary duo of all time. I absolutely loved these guys together because he had JR who is JR. He was at the peak of his abilities at this time. Awesome, awesome emotion and passion every single night. But then you add Paul Heyman into the mix. A Paul Heyman who had just come over to the WWF from the defunct ECW. So he's all full of piss and vinegar. He's, you know, having a good old time. He's trying to fuck with Vince McMahon on the mic, like through his headset and all that shit that we've heard over the years. And he was the perfect, like, antithesis of JR. He kind of provided, um, whereas JR and King were kind of like a cohesive unit, uh, JR and Heyman were kind of like butting heads at the commentary table and it provided the just the right amount of entertainment from from that booth and uh, like not too much to where it overshadowed the action in the ring but enough to keep the viewer interested and to uh, tell the story of what's going on in the ring so both these guys killed it during the show I just want to add that in there I absolutely loved Heyman at commentary. I feel like they, that gets kind of overshadowed by all the other stuff that he's done. Uh, maybe rightfully so, but awesome stuff there. But um, as far as the matches, first match you have Chris Jericho versus William Regal. And this match is for the Intercontinental Championship. This match is pretty solid. I will say these first couple matches, it felt like the show took a while to kick in. Um, like I said, I haven't I haven't watched this match in years, and I was kind of worried that it wouldn't uh, reach my expectations. It, I was worried that it wouldn't be as good as I thought it was, um, but that was no issue. But I will say that it did take the crowd a few matches to really get into it. Um, they were into it, you know, during the entrances and whatnot. Um, but the match itself, I mean, it was it was a solid match. It, nothing against the match. Uh, it seemed like the crowd was a little bit flat for the most of it, and even the, the finish was kind of out of nowhere. Uh, Chris Jericho ends up winning with a lion salt, which uh, I don't know if he was winning very, very many matches with that at the time. That was a time where, I mean, nowadays he'll, he'll never win a match with that, but I don't think anybody was expecting that to be the finish. Uh, came around the seven minute mark. Um, I feel like it had more in the tank, but um, definitely a good match. Uh, we'll never complain about watching Chris Jericho and William Regal fight each other. Um, this was like the Jericho pissing in Regal's tea uh, <laughs> blow off. Um, so it's kind of a silly little deal here, but um, I, I enjoyed it a lot. William Regal had a lot of heat during this time as a commissioner, doing probably some of the best work of his whole career. So loved watching this again. After that, you have a, uh, a six-man tag. You have Taz in the APA versus the right to censor. Bull Buchanan. The Good Father and Val Venus. It was like a quick four minute match. It was fine for what it was. Really, at the end of the day, it was the blow off for the right to censor. They had been a, a, a huge. They, they, as a group, no group had more heat than the right to censor, man. Especially during this time when everything, everybody wanted crude humor. They wanted titties. They wanted assholes. They wanted foul language. They wanted profanity. They wanted 
blood and guts. They wanted all of that. Attitude Era was defined by that kind of stuff, and the right to censor was kind of the antithesis of that. So naturally, people are going to hate their guts. So yeah, and then you have on the other side of the coin, you have people like Taz and Bradshaw and Farouk, who are, again, just the opposite of what the right to censor stands for and pretty much represent what all the fans love and uh, why they watch the product. So good setup here. It did feel kind of like uh, almost too quick, but uh, it was what it was. It I guess it didn't need to go any longer than it did. I mean, it's not like we're going to get a fucking five-star match from the good father and Bull Buchanan, but it didn't overstay its welcome. And at the end of the day, it was just the right to censor finally getting their comeuppance. And uh, I think shortly after that, they disbanded. But good little segment here. After that, you have the hardcore title on the line. You have Kane versus Big Show versus the champion Raven. This was fun. Most of the match occurred backstage. So I think the crowd was kind of annoyed by it. But um, it was a fun match, man. You had Raven getting thrown through a glass window. You had Kane and Big Show like knocking each other through walls and ripping doors off and throwing fences at each other. Uh, you had that little spot where Raven was like trying to run away with a golf cart, but he like runs into a wall and like I think he then he like he runs over like a cord that like knocks the Titantron view out. Um, it was <laughs> that was kind of a disaster, but the match itself as a viewer, was uh, very entertaining. Uh, the Hardcore title, this is probably the biggest platform the Hardcore title ever had, um, especially when you had stars like Kane and Big Show involved. And Raven, who was probably one of the mo most prolific Hardcore champions of all time. Wasn't he like a 20-time champion or something? But uh, <clears throat> good little match here. Kane ends up winning when he uh, boots Big Show and Raven off the stage through like a platform on the ground. And then Kane like jumps off the stage with an elbow drop which is a crazy little spot, and then um, ends up pinning the Big Show. Wins the Hardcore title. New your new Hardcore champion is Kane. Fun stuff there. After that, you have a match that I kind of forgot happened on this card. was was uh, Eddie Guerrero versus Test. Now, first of all, what the fuck is up with Perry Saturn's hat? <laughs> I don't know if he was just trying to rib everybody or what, but this is kind of the time where the Radicals are still... I think the Radicals are still around because like a year before this, they broke up for a little bit and then they all kind of came back together, but then they kind of kicked Chris Benoit out of it. So now he's on his own, but the other three are still together. I don't know. It's a whole weird thing at this time, but Eddie Guerrero, Perry Saturn, Dean Malenko. If I remember correctly, I think Eddie Guerrero actually leaves. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I don't think he's in the company too much long after this. Um, until, of course, he comes back in, like, mid-2002 or something like that. So it's kind of interesting to see him on the tail end of his first run here in the WWF. But uh, regardless, Eddie comes out with Perry Saturn. Perry, Perry Saturn's wearing this weird pink furry hat for whatever reason. Um, but the match itself was pretty good. Like I said, it's, I think the crowd was still kind of warming up at this point. But um, they popped when they, they needed to pop. Uh, Tess had a lot of high-impact moves. But yeah, I mean, overall, this match is kind of forgettable. Um, it wasn't bad by any means, but um, it felt pretty quick. I mean, the build to this match was pretty limited. Uh, at this point, Tess had been built up to be uh, a pretty credible contender. Um, I mean, he's the champion here. I guess they're... I don't know if they were trying to build up the European title or trying to build up Tess. But either way, I mean, both kind of were thriving at this point because Tess was getting... A lot of big wins on Raw and SmackDown and was a pretty prominent figure on those shows. Kind of seems like they kind of inserted Eddie in here because, you know, okay, Tess is the champion. Who is he going to defend the title against? Oh, Eddie Guerrero is not doing anything that night. Might as well throw him in there and they had like a week or two of build. But the match was good. Tess and uh, Eddie were both athletically around the peak of their careers. And uh, I think they gelled pretty well together. But um, at the end of the day, Eddie ends up beating Test and winning the European title. Radicals are involved. You obviously had Perry Saturn out there from the beginning. But then Dean Malenko comes out towards the end of the match when Test hits Eddie with a big boot, which is his finish at the time. Test has him pinned. Dean Malenko comes out, pulls Test off of Eddie as the three counts about to come down. Test is pissed. He's irate. He grabs Dean, tries to bring him in the ring. And as all this hullabaloo is going on, 
Paris Saturn, throws Eddie the European title. Eddie clocks Tess in the face with it. Bang, bang, boom. One, two, three. Eddie is your new champ. But as far as Tess goes, I'm surprised I never really expanded upon that push um, for whatever reason. It felt like that guy kind of, he had the look, he had the size. Maybe they thought he wasn't a good enough talker or maybe he just didn't have that it factor for some reason. But whatever the case may be, Eddie Guerrero gets the win here. And after that, you have Kurt Angle versus Chris Benoit. Now, I can just tell you that, and you know how good this match is. Like I said earlier, the build to this match was heavily influenced by the fact that these two guys are like two of the most technical wrestlers on the roster at the time. And in an era where there's a lot of flashy characters and a lot of shenanigans, these two guys are just like hardcore pro wrestlers. And in this match, they kind of tell that story. So at the beginning of the match, there's a lot of amateur wrestling. Obviously, Kurt Angle is a gold medalist in the Olympics in amateur wrestling. Uh, but Chris Benoit here kind of wants to compete with him, to kind of show Kurt that he can hang with him. Um, and he pretty much does. I mean, there's a lot of back and forth, uh, just pure grappling at the beginning. And as Benoit actually starts to get the upper hand at some point in which Kurt Angle retaliates by just giving him a forearm shiver right to the jaw. Frustrated. He says, fuck this wrestling. I'm just going to punch you in the face. So that was fun. And at that point, it became more of a pro wrestling style, quote unquote, match. Um, both guys were trying to use each other's submissions. Very, very. It, it, it was very apparent throughout the match that each guy wanted to win by submission, which made the finish even better because the finish ultimately is with Angle giving Chris Benoit a low blow and then giving him a schoolboy while holding the tights, which is like the most pro wrestling finish ever so that kind of feeds into kurt's hypocrisy his desperation that he has to use those tactics to win a match which is great because he's a heel and he wins by being a heel crazy concept right uh so yeah kurt angle gets the win here awesome match awesome match and after that you have china versus ivory for the women's title now like i said and the previous Right to Censor match. Now, if you don't know, Ivory was also a part of the Right to Censor, and she is also the women's champion at the time. But as far as the Right to Censor goes, this show kind of felt like a blow off for them. Ivory and the Right to Censor kind of put China out of action in kayfabe uh, with a pile driver that broke China's neck. China is returned. He, she actually ended up returning at the Royal Rumble in 2001, which by the way, I go over that show in the archives. Um, China comes back at Royal Rumble 2001, but evidently she came back too soon, ended up re-injuring her neck in that match and gave Ivory kind of a cheap win. So China stayed off TV until maybe like a week or two before WrestleMania. But here at this show is her first match back and it is pretty much a squash. China, you know, she's fully healed at this point. She's still dominant, and she kind of just ragdolls Ivory throughout this whole match, beats her in like two minutes. I will note that the, the rest of Right to Censor was banned from ringside, so this kind of ultimately made a, it was a kind of a put up or shut up moment for Ivory, and um, she just couldn't contend with China, who, you know, a year or two earlier was competing with men. So obviously China dominated Ivory here and won the Women's Championship. I actually forget how she ended up losing it, but I guess... We'll find that out in the future as I keep going on with these shows. But um, the match was what it was. It served its purpose, gave China that feel-good victory, and uh, further further solidified the downward spiral of the right to censor. This match maybe could have used the rest of the right to censor at ringside, you know, to build a little bit of drama in this match. But if they wanted to just set out to have a squash match, I guess it was what it was. But um, whatever. Next match. Oh boy. You have the Battle of the McMahons. You have Vince versus Shane in a street fight with Mick Foley as your special guest referee. And then at ringside, you have Stephanie McMahon. Now to catch everybody up, Vince basically demanded a divorce from Linda, which made Linda have a panic attack of sorts, it had forced her to be medicated. And uh, Vince pretty much over-medicated her to the point where she was in a comatose state for, like, months. Just setting the scene for you guys. Man, this match was fucking fun, dude. The crowd was so into it, dude, at every point. Dude, every, every chair shot, every monitor shot. Shane did the spot where he jumps on the announce table 
from the ring, which is one of the first, not the very first time he did it, but one of the first times he did it. So at this point, it's kind of old hat now, but it was a crazy spot at the time. And he like almost like jumped over the announce table. It's crazy the distance that dude got, but both guys are bleeding. It's a mess. It's brutal. Both McMahons are bloody, just absolutely spent. And then, well, then what happens? Well, Trish Stratus, as instructed by Vince earlier in the night, wheels out Linda McMahon. Of course, Linda is still basically a zombie at this point, a corpse, if you will. Pretty much just shoving her out there to watch her husband beat the shit out of her son. Oh, wrestling at its finest. So Trish wheels Linda out there. Um, Trish has been, you know, in previous weeks or months, has been the uh, kind of the side chick of Vince McMahon. So they were kind of aligned there. So she brings out Linda to a fallen Vince McMahon who's like on his knees, still reeling from all of the punishment that he's taken during this match. He kind of gets up, looks at her, he sees Linda, and he gets like, he just sees red, right? He just... Oh, I hate this one. I hate her. I hate her. And then Trish walks up to Vince and slaps him right in the fucking face. Huge turn here. Trish and Steph had a match at No Way Out at the previous pay-per-view. And she was getting, Trish was getting huge reactions from the crowd. Um, everybody loved her. At this point, she was one of the hottest things going at the time, especially as far as women are concerned. Um, and she's only hit the tip of the iceberg for, you know, the exposure and the fame that she's going to reach. So huge turn here, face turn by Trish slapping Vince McMahon. Her and Stephanie get into it. They start catfighting. They fight all the way to the back. So Trish, Stephanie, both out of the equation here. Now you just have Linda McMahon, who is helpless on a wheelchair out there and uh, basically there for Vince's disposal. They get towards the end of the match. You have Shane has just been beaten down by Vince. He's basically still kind of had all of the wind taken out of him from missing that elbow drop earlier on the announce table. Vince is kind of dominating. So Shane's in the ring. Vince is about to get in the ring, but then he sees Linda. Linda's just sitting there, sitting there in her wheelchair. Vince just fucking ragdolls her, throws her in the ring, sets up a chair, puts Linda up. Puts Linda in that chair, makes her watch. Vince has a trash can, a metal trash can. Shane McMahon is on his knees pleading. Vince McMahon is going to smash Shane in the head with this trash can. He hits him once. He hits him twice. He goes to hit him a third time. Linda stands up. Holy shit, that pop, dude. You could, If you go back and watch this match to that moment where Linda stands up out of her chair. Now remember, she had been confined to a wheelchair for months, not speaking, not emoting, even a little bit for months. She had to watch Vince make out with Trish Stratus right in front of her. She had to watch her husband and her son fight for months and months. And then she stands out of her chair and you just see thousands and thousands of people standing to their feet in amazement. That was such good shit, dude. Oh my god. That made the entire build worth it. That was a perfect blow-off. Linda gets up, kicks Vince McMahon right in the fucking ball sack. And then from there, you know, Shane takes him, throws him in the corner, kicks the shit out of him, puts a trash can in front of his face, gives him the first ever coast-to-coast, -coast, a beautifully executed one. Which at the time, I, that, that was like unheard of. I know, you know Van Dam had been doing it in ECW or whatever. But we were watching this and my girlfriend's watching it with me. And she's like, there's no way he's going to reach him, is there? He could possibly jump that far. But then he does it and it's like beautiful looking. And then that's the end of the match. Shane ends up pinning him after that. One, two, three. You're winner of this match. Shane McMahon. Awesome, awesome story. Awesome build up to this, man. Vince McMahon was such a perfect heel during this time. Um, he was just... A complete piece of shit, both to his daughter, to Trish, to Linda, to Mick Foley. Then you add the element of him, you know, being a dick about WCW folding and 
All of it, man. He was just, he executed everything so well. And the crowd just ate it up, man. So many awesome elements to this match. So many crazy things happening in one match. But as far as like the amount of fun you have watching a wrestling match, this is probably might have been the most fun match of the entire show. Loved it. Although I say that, but the next match may have been not only the match of the night, in my opinion, but maybe my favorite match of all time. You have TLC2. Edge and Christian versus the Dudley Boys versus the Hardy Boys. This is everything and anything you could possibly ask for in a wrestling match, dude. It was, um, you know, they have had ladder matches before. They had had another TLC match also. So the bar had already been set really high, really high. But uh, somehow these guys set that bar even higher with this match, dude. It was nuts. And the thing I loved about this match, as opposed to, you know, modern day ladder matches, is that each team was trying to get the fucking title belts. You know, the premise of the match. Each team was trying to get the belt and, you know, the other teams were equally as desperately trying to stop them. And if people would get knocked off ladders through tables or, you know, if somebody got hit with a ladder or hit with a chair, it all made sense. It all was organic and it all made sense in the context of what they were doing. You didn't have three guys working together to set up ladders in a, like a jigsaw format to get people to bounce off one ladder onto another ladder through a table through five chairs. No, it'd be like, you know, Bubba and Matt Hardy were each trying to set up their own ladders. Bubba would see Matt Hardy trying to do this and he would smack Matt Hardy in the fucking head with it to stop him so that he could be the only one setting up a ladder. All this, it was, it was, it was a spot filled match. It was a car crash spectacle. I understand, but everything felt so smooth and it felt like it made sense. Whether it was, you know, Matt and Bubba flying off of a 20 foot ladder through a stack of four tables, or it was, uh, Christian throwing a chair at Bubba, Bubba catching it, and then Edge hitting Bubba with another chair to hit the other chair, or whether it was that, you know, that famous spear off the top of the ladder onto Jeff Hardy. It didn't feel like these guys were collaborating together. It felt like they were fighting each other. And it felt like these crazy high-flying moments were actually organically happening. Which is why this match is so awesome. And then you add the element that they were all constantly trying to get those title belts. You had the elements of, you know, each team had their, their kind of third person, right? The Hardys had Lita. The Dudleys had Spike Dudley. Edge and Christian had Rhino. And you had all three of those guys interfering in the match as well and do, also doing these crazy spots and adding their characters to the match. And ultimately, what ends up winning the match is Rhino kind of lifting Christian up to get those title belts. So the heels, once again, heels winning in a heel fashion. So they, 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 they win the match, but they maintain their heat and they maintain their character kind of ethos in that, yeah, they won, but they won in kind of a shitty way. By and large, I mean, I, I can speak an hour about this match, but overall, just awesome, awesome stuff. At the time, you know, you didn't see things like that, like this very often. It was truly a spectacle. It was unbelievable to watch. Um, the Hardys were red hot. The Dudleys were red hot. Edge and Christian were red hot. Tag team wrestling has never been better than it was on this night. Love this match. But hey, if you're going to outdo TLC2, might as well be with a gimmick battle royal. <laughs> you had the fuck it. Yeah, you had Hillbilly Jim. You had Iron Sheik. You had Duke the Dumpster Jose. You had uh, who else? Nikolai Volkov. Jim Cornette. Brother, there was so many, so many <laughs> hilarious characters. This match is really pretty much about the entrances. I mean, you're you're not gonna throw Brother Love in there. You're not gonna throw Bruce Prichard in there and expect him to have a five star match. No, you just want everybody to make their entrances, kind of get that pop from the crowd from seeing these, you know, characters, getting that nostalgia trip, and then just have a quick little battle royal, and then get you know, don't overstay your welcome and get out of there. So yeah, it was like a. How many people? Like 15 people were in this, but the match lasted like three minutes. Iron Sheik ends up winning by uh, eliminating Hillbilly Jim. Who Hillbilly Jim was still fucking jacked at this point, man. Good God. Everybody else was <laughs> struggling, but man, Hillbilly Jim was over like Rover on this night. And uh, 
it was a good call having him being the last eliminated by the Iron Sheik, who still had that that mega heat, brother. So it was a silly little deal here, but it was a good let up from you know TLC two and Shane McMahon versus Vince McMahon were the two matches before this. You need a little bit of a let up. So, like I said, back to this being like a perfect show. This battle royal was perfectly placed on the show, in my opinion. Fun stuff. After that, you have Triple H versus The Undertaker. This match is pretty good. It was definitely like almost a forgotten match at this point, man. Because, you know, the build to this match is actually pretty hot shotted. Um, you know, Triple H is fresh off the heels off of beating Stone Cold at uh, No Way Out. So he's red hot. He, you know, he has all the momentum going forward, but he's not in the main event because, you know, Rock's champion. And Stone Cold won the Royal Rumble. So where does that put him? And that, that was kind of the build here. He was like frustrated that he's not going to be the one closing the show. Even though he's probably arguably the most dominant guy in the company at this point. Undertaker takes issue with that. Basically saying that, you know, Triple H is trying to claim that he's the top dog. But that dog is standing in Undertaker's yard. And ultimately Undertaker just lets him live in it. Etc. Etc. Then, um... It was fun, though. You had, like, Triple H throwing Undertaker's bike off the stage. You have um, Undertaker attacking Triple H's limo with a steel pipe. It was a lot of fun stuff. You had the whole restraining order between Stephanie and Undertaker. You have Kane getting involved. It was a lot of fun stuff in this buildup. Um, but ultimately, it all, what it all comes down to is that you have the two biggest guys that are not Stone Cold or The Rock in this match. Basically, pushing forward who's going to be in the title picture. In the future. The match itself is pretty good. Um, a lot of, you know, Attitude Era style brawling. A lot of in the crowd stuff. Um, I think there's there's one spot where they're both like on a, like a pedestal out in the crowd where like the cameras are. And uh, Undertaker chokeslams Triple H off of it. And they make it like Triple H fell into this infinite abyss where he will never be found again. But he fell like six feet or something. But that's probably like what people think of when they think of this match, is that spot right there. Uh, they get back to the ring, they start brawling. Ref, but ref ultimately like, gets like, te like um, Triple H gets catapulted into the ref or something. Undertaker hits a choke slam, tries to pin Triple H, gets a two count. Undertaker gets frustrated and just elbow drops the ref. And the ref is out for literally like 15 minutes. I think it's actually before they went in the crowd, as a matter of fact. But they get back to the ring. Ref is still dead. Triple H introduces a sledgehammer into the match. And that sledgehammer is a pretty big focal point of this match. They're both kind of like, you know, Triple H tries to use it, but Undertaker counters. And then Undertaker grabs it. He's about to hit Triple H in the head with it. And then Triple H hits him with a low blow. So the sledgehammer is kind of like flying around the ring. Everybody's trying to utilize it to their advantage. It's uh, pretty much built as a, as a killer weapon at this point. And it doesn't get used until Undertaker goes for a last ride. But as Triple H is getting hoisted onto Undertaker's shoulders, he still maintains the grip of the sledgehammer. And as Triple H is sitting on Taker's shoulders, he wallops him in the fucking face with it, knocks him out, and gets a really close two count at this point in the match. Cool false finish right there. Really thought he was going to lose at the time. Um, obviously now you know because of the streak and whatnot. But at the end of the day, Undertaker ends up nailing the last ride as uh, Triple H is pounding on him in the corner. Undertaker counters, hits the last ride. One, two, three. Undertaker is your winner here. Pretty good match. Um, after watching it back, I, I enjoyed it, but in my opinion, it doesn't even come close to the stuff that they ended up doing later in their careers at WrestleMania. Um, what was it, 27, 28, something like that, where they had their two back to back matches and then the inclusion of Shawn Michaels to all of that. Um, just really good stuff from these two, um, which I think looking back at it, those two matches kind of overshadow this WrestleMania 17 match and all the other matches that they had together. Um, but here, this match, I enjoyed it. Good stuff from both guys. Then, your main event. Who doggy, man. is a no DQ match for the WWF title. You have Stone Cold versus The Rock. Already went over the build to this match. Won't <laughs> keep harping on it, but just tremendous, tremendous stuff. Two of the top guys in the industry going at it. And one thing, going back and watching this match again for the first time in a while. So I'm, I'm fresh off the heels off of reading JR's book, Under the Black Hat. And he goes into a lot of detail about this match. 
and about the commentary and how it really helped push the angle along. So, spoiler alert, Stone Cold turns heel at the end of this match. A very notorious moment and um, a moment that is very uh, controversial amongst fans and people in the industry as far as whether it was a good idea or not. But here at the time watching this match, it's very evident how the commentators are kind of setting the table for it. And it's such a, they do such a good job at it. You know, Stone Cold comes out and they're really harping on, you know, his character, how he, uh, the kind of, kind of stuff that he stands for, how he has such a strong moral code to himself and that he'll do anything that it takes to win. And that's really the story of this match here. From the build up to the match itself is that Stone Cold is desperate to win the WWF title here. He's desperate and he'll do anything that it takes to win. And the commentary does a really good job at setting the table for that at the beginning of the match and throughout the match itself. Um, like, like the Undertaker Triple H match, a lot of brawling, a lot of punching, a lot of fighting in the crowd, but the crowd was into it at every single second. Um, they fight in the crowd for a little bit, steel chairs and TV monitors start getting involved. Both guys are just pouring blood. They're kind of going at it in the ring. Uh, they, they trade sharpshooters in the ring, um, which is an aspect of this match that I did not remember. It was interesting to see Stone Cold locking a sharpshooter at this point in, the, in his career. They're, uh, kind of <laughs> trying to steal each other's finishers. Um, but every, every time... One guy hits a big move. He can't capitalize because he's been so brutalized. And then uh, we reach towards the end of the match. Vince McMahon comes out. Pissed after his loss earlier in the night. But nobody knows why. You know, Stone Cold and The Rock are both tippy-top baby faces. Both guys have had a lot of issues with Vince McMahon in the past. What could Vince possibly want? What could possibly be his role in this match? We find that out later when The Rock hits the people's elbow on Stone Cold. Goes for the cover. One, two. Vince McMahon slides in, rips the rock right off of Stone Cold, saving Steve Austin from losing the match. Utter confusion falls upon the crowd. The rock, of course, is furious. He uh, chases Vince McMahon out of the ring and around the ring. Vince McMahon slides back in the ring. Rock follows him, runs into a rock bottom from Stone Cold. One, two, kick out. Stone Cold gets super frustrated, super upsetty spaghetti, and uh, that he cannot beat The Rock. He hits the stunner, doesn't beat The Rock. Hits him with the chair, does not beat The Rock. Austin goes for another stunner, gets blocked by The Rock. They tie up again, and then Stone Cold ends up giving The Rock a low blow. Now, I spoke before how the story of this match was based on how Stone Cold was desperate to get this win. So desperate that he would even resort to a low blow, which is a tactic that he wouldn't typically use. So we have him giving Rock the low blow. We have him kind of accepting this interference from Vince McMahon. What is going on here? And then, on top of that, Stone Cold actually tells Vince McMahon to get him a chair. So now they're actually cooperating. What does Stone Cold do? He tells Vince to hand him the chair. He tells Vince to hand him a steel chair. Stone Cold starts walloping him, walloping him, walloping him, pins him, two count. Crowd goes fucking ape shit, dude. Vince McMahon then gets in the ring, hands him a chair again, starts encouraging Stone Cold to hit him more with the chair and more and more. Stone Cold tells Vince to hold the rock up so he can hit him with the chair some more. So Stone Cold and Vince McMahon are cooperating, which is absolutely unheard of at the time. This company was built off of them hating each other, and now they are working together. Absolutely insane. Stone Cold ends up getting the win here after more and more chair shots. Just a dirty, dirty finish with Vince McMahon's help. Who? Holy shit. What? a finish so we have austin and mcmahon aligned they shake hands after the match they have a beer together over rock's broken body 
And now nobody knows what's going to happen after this, man. I think Rock goes to shoot a movie after this, and then Austin just goes on a tear as a heel. And it is a brutal, brutal time. Some may love it, some may hate it, but it's definitely an interesting time and definitely a great, great refresh of the Austin character. Um, crazy, crazy stuff. But yeah, man, an awesome way to end the show with a crazy moment like that. Although, you know... Maybe a heel turn in your hometown isn't the best of moves. Maybe it's not the best of timing, but whatever. Just uh, icing on the cake of a perfectly put together show. Once again, thank you all for listening. I really, really enjoy going back and watching these shows and kind of reviewing them. Uh, it's a pleasure for me. I hope it's a pleasure for you. I will continue to do these WWF Attitude Era pay-per-views as well as TNA stuff, ROH stuff, all the other shenanigans I'm always up to. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you for all the support so far. Really, really appreciate it. I am hard. Thank you.